Welcome to our final lecture on the Egan Skate Helper model. Thank you so much for persevering with me for the last two lessons, including tonight. Lah. It'll be all three lessons together. Okay, usual. Let me just do a quick recap for us, and then we'll pick it up from where we left off. Okay? All right. So on Monday, what did we cover? Well, on Monday, what we did mainly was for me to complete covering review task 1B, which was really about the different ways that we can be using in helping to challenge some of the aspects within our client story so that through the challenging, the clients may begin to develop some new perspectives about their story. And following that, we began to look into task 1C, which is all about the big L word called leverage and this other word called value. And what seems to be la, the main objective behind task 1C? Well, it's really about helping clients to decide, helping clients to prioritize which particular issue they want to be working with us during our counseling sessions with them. That's what we did. And following that, I began to do a recap for you about stage 2. And once again, stage 2 is all about the big mega term called preferred picture. And this is where Egan says that we are to try our best to get our clients to start thinking about what do the clients want for their preferred future? What do the clients want about their preferred picture? And this is where we began to talk about the idea of using two techniques under task 2A, which is we may want to use a technique called brainstorming to begin to get clients to generate possibilities about their future. Or we can be using examples as well as models to get clients to be generating possibilities for their preferred future. Very important, whenever we are using uh, brainstorming, it's important that we suspend our judgment. In other words, we are to not try to shut down options. We are to not try to comment that this doesn't work, that doesn't work. But it's really about just letting it go and letting the client just brainstorm. Uh, what could be the many, many, many possibilities that might make up their preferred future or their preferred future. Similarly, when we are getting the client to think about examples or even models, right? it's important sometimes that we may want to get clients to think about more than one model, more than one example, so that there might be more possibilities generated rather than to be quick to shut down those possibilities. Okay, all right. So there we have it. The whole of search 1, as well as beginning to look at task 2A of search 2. Good. So any questions for me about whatever that's been covered as of Monday? Anything to clarify or to ask me about? Okay, can I? Okay, good. So. Let me give all of us an overview about how we we'll are spending our final lecture on the Egan Skilled Helper model. Well, as you can almost imagine, right? Tonight will be all about the remaining task as well as the remaining stages. So I'm hoping that from now all the way till break time, we see how the time goes. I want to complete uh, task 2A, task 2B, as well as task 2C. We we'll go for our break. After break, I want to continue to talk about stage 3, looking mainly at task 3A, 3B, as well as 3C. Following that, I hope time will allow us to do a role play together. Following that, I want to wrap up our time by giving us some ideas about the MCQ assessment and also to share with you some of the important considerations to bear in mind as we begin to apply the Egan Skill Helper model in our counseling practice. So I hope that that will take us all the way till 9.45 tonight. Okay? All right, ah? good. Let's go to work, shall we? Okay, so let's... Uh, so if I, if I can invite you to uh, bring out the handout on stage two, that will be, if I'm not wrong, handout six. Let me just show it to you. That was the handout that was uploaded uh, on Monday, you can remember. Yes, on the screen now. Give me a while while I just bring all your videos to my other screen. Oh, 
OK, so here we go. Now, so on Monday, we look at option three, which was brainstorming. as well as option four, which was the use of examples as well as models to get clients to start to think about possibilities for their preferred future, possibilities for their preferred mm, picture, basically. So now I'm going to spend quite a bit of time unpacking the first two options uh, for all of us. Okay? So let me begin by looking at the first option, which is the miracle question. Now I remember on Monday, I think it was Ning's group, if I'm not wrong, eh, who actually mentioned about using the miracle question as a way to get clients to be thinking more about positives, eh, especially for clients whom tend to be having a very negative mindset or very one-track mindset. Eh, right? So tonight, I want to spend quite a bit of time unpacking for you how do we go about asking or using eh, the miracle question to accomplish the main objective for task 2A within stage 2. So first and foremost, let me give credit where it's due. La. What credit? Well, here it comes. You will discover that the miracle question did not originate from the skilled helper model. The miracle question was originated from this particular counseling approach called da -da -da -da, the solution-focused brief therapy. The solution-focused brief therapy. Short form, acronym for that is called uh, SFBT. Okay? Now, advertisement. For those of you who are going on to do your grad dip with us, ah, at your grad dip level, there will be a module solely dedicated to solution-focused brief therapy. So at that level, uh, I'll leave it to my good friends, Alan uh, and possibly Mr. Lim, right, to cover with you what solution-focused brief therapy is all about. Uh. If I may give you an appetizer, it will sound like this. SFBT is quite closely resembling the Egan Skilled Helper model. I say again, SFBT resembles the Egan Skilled Helper model and a fair bit, especially stage 2 as well as stage 3. So I'll leave it to the two guys uh, at grad deep level to impress you with the SFBT model. Okay? So you probably could ask me, hey Lawrence, uh, we are talking about Egan here. We are not actually learning about SFBT. So why are you bringing in a technique within SFBT? Well, now comes the explanation. Now for those of you who happen to have a skilled helper book, 7th edition or 8th edition, you will discover that under the chapter on stage 2, Gerard Egan actually spent quite a few pages introducing to all the readers solution-focused brief therapy. In fact, Egan, when he first started developing his model, he recognized, what did he recognize? He recognized that one of the ways to do good stage 2 work, one of the ways to do good task 2A work is to leverage on the strengths of solution-focused brief therapy. That's the reason why I felt that, hmm, since Egan mentioned that in his book, I felt that it's only fair for me la, to follow up on what he wrote in his book to share with you la, a technique which he would use, which I would use, to be able to accomplish task 2A, which is using the miracle question within the SFBT framework. Okay, good. So here we go. Now, could I just invite you to read through this particular um, question? Okay, yeah. And then I will share with you what are some uh, important things to remember lah, if we are thinking about using this question to do task 2A. Which way?
All done? Let's talk about it, shall we? Now, first and foremost, let me first unpack for all of us why did the founders of SIPT decided to include the word miracle inside this particular question. My friends, the choice of the word miracle was not fluke. It was chosen intentionally. So now let me unpack for you. Lah. Why? Why did the founders of SMBT decide to choose the word miracle to be inserted into this particular question? Now comes the explanation. Now, if you were to read some of the SMBT books, you will discover that the founders, who were they? The husband's name is called Steve De Caesar. The wife's name is called uh, Insu Kimberg. Okay, so if you ever were to read some books on SIPT, you will discover that one of the main reasons why the two founders decided to add the word miracle into this question is because they wanted to give clients an excuse. I say again, the founders wanted to give clients an excuse. An excuse to do what? Well, an excuse to imagine their preferred future. An excuse to imagine what do they want in their preferred life. Got it? My friends, I don't know about you, but for me, I find that sometimes, right, the older we get, what do we lose? Well, we lose the ability to be creative. We lose the ability to be imaginative. Why? It's because the older we get, what do we do? We tend to only think about things which are rational. We tend to only think about things which are logical. So now comes the problem, my friends. When we only limit our thinking to rational things, logical things, well, it makes sense to do so, but we lose out on being creative. We lose out on using our imagination, using the power of hypotheticals to create possibilities in our life. Got it? And so if you were to ever read any book on SIPT, you will discover that in Sue and Steve, they felt that whenever they are counselling a client, they want to somehow give this client a reason. They want to somehow give this client an excuse to leave their logical mind behind, to leave their rational mind behind, and to allow their imagination to take over for just a while, to allow their lateral thinking to take over for just a while. And guess what? They found that one of the best ways to do so is by using the word miracle. It's because the word miracle somehow will give me the reason to start to let my imagination caps take over for just a while. Can you all follow me, my friends? So that is the first reason why lah. Uh, the founders decided to throw in this word miracle. Second reason. Second reason was quite a cool reason. Now, I remember when I went up to Milwaukee to learn SIBT many, many years ago, Insu Kimberg, the co founder, she actually mentioned that in the training. She said, The reason why they chose the word miracle, second reason was because one day, Insu Kimberg was actually counseling a lady doing counseling. And so Kimber actually acknowledged that during that session, she actually felt stuck. She didn't really know how to continue on with that lady. And so they came to a dead silence in that session. Then suddenly, right, after the long silence, the lady client said, if only a miracle happens to me, life will be so good. So Insu Kimber, being stuck at that moment, what did she do? she decided to go along with what the client said. She said, okay, well, suppose, lah, 
Suppose the miracle did happen to you. Lah. How will your life begin to be different? And guess what? As she went along with the client's idea, the rest of was history. Client began to generate one possibility after another possibility. And before Isu Kimber know it, the mood of the session began to take a turn for the better. And before she knows it, the spirit of hopefulness was beginning to fill the room. And before she knows it, client began to feel excited. Client began to feel motivated in wanting to make some of the possibilities generated a reality. Okay? So that was the second reason why. And so came back after that session, decided lah, why not we add in the word miracle to really provide lah, a tool right, to facilitate clients to really allow their imagination to take over for just a short while. Up to this point, all okay? Okay, huh? good, let me continue. Now comes the execution of this question. My friends, I don't know about you, as you were reading through this particular miracle question, notice that it is quite a long question, isn't it? Quite long, right? And besides this question being long, it also sounds quite weird, isn't it? <laughs> right? So now comes the best part. Whenever we are going to ask our client a long question or a weird sounding question, it's always important that we prepare the client before we ask them such a long, such a weird question. Because if you do not prepare your client before you ask them such a question, more likely than not, they will reject this question. More likely than not, they will tell you, this is crap. And they would resist following you after you ask them the miracle question. That's the reason why it's so important that we have to do good preparation work before we ask our client the miracle question. So you probably could ask me, right, so Lawrence, how? How are we going to prepare our client before we ask them the miracle question? Notice, my friends, in the notes, this handout, I intentionally left a blank here. Notice. Right. So why? Why did I intentionally leave this blank? It's because I wanted to share with you how can we go about preparing our clients before we ask them the miracle question. Okay. So now I'm going to offer you two ideas. Two suggestions on how can we go about preparing our clients before we ask them the miracle question. So here we go. So make it simpler. Let me type it out for you lah, so you can see clearly. Okay, so here we go. Okay, should be big enough. Okay, first way. So, if you ever were to watch Insu Kimberg at work, if you ever were to watch Steve DeCesar at work, you will find that more often than not, the two founders, they usually will prepare their client by asking them this question. Oh, so John, are you an imaginative person? Oh, Mary, are you an imaginative person? So, why? Why would this be a possible way to prepare our client? It's because as we ask them this question, we are sort of hinting to them lah, that what's to come requires them to use some of their imagination. Can you follow me, my friends? Now, if I may be a bit defiant here, <laughs> here is my take, my two cents worth of take. Lah. Now, Having asked the miracle question for quite a long part of my career, right, I can say to you this. More often than not, this will not be the way that I 
will prepare my client before I ask them the miracle question. Why not? Here comes the reason. Notice, this particular question, what is it? It is a, it is a closed-ended question, isn't it? Right? It is a what? Closed-ended question. Now, if I may bring you back to your training under Dr. Augustine, what did he teach you? He probably would have told you, right, that in counselling, we always try our best to ask open-ended questions rather than closed-ended questions. Why? It's because open-ended questions usually give clients ample room to tell us what's on their mind. Closed-ended questions have a way of what? Shutting down doors, shutting down possibilities. So can you imagine if I were to ask Peter, Oh, Peter, are you an imaginative person? If Peter say to me, I'm sorry, I'm not, die lah. <laughs> right? Peter just said he's not imaginative. So now I have to decide, oh, should I drop the miracle question completely or should I ask something else? You follow? So, very important. So in my opinion, I tend not to use this particular question to prepare my client for the miracle question. So what will be the way that I will prepare my client? Now let me offer you another alternative, which is here. Okay, so this will be my version. This will be the way that I would use to prepare my client before I ask them the miracle question. So it goes like this. I'm going to ask you a rather strange question that requires some bits of your imagination. My friends, if you compare this particular version of mine with the earlier version, which is, are you an imaginative person? What seems to be the major difference? Well, for this particular version, it is not a question. It's actually a instruction. It's actually a directive. Okay, so I say again, this particular version, it is not a question. It is actually a directive. It's actually a statement. And why would I pick a statement over a question? It's because a statement has a way of setting the context, but it facilitates movement towards what's to come. So I say again, a statement has a way of setting the tone, setting the context, and it has a way of helping clients to go with the flow so that they may be more willing to go along to answer my miracle question. That's why I choose to use this particular way rather than the earlier way, which is, are you an imaginative person? Second reason. Notice, I intentionally added two words lah, that hopefully will increase my client's tendency in going along to the miracle question. First, is this word called strange? So I said, so John, I'm going to ask you a rather strange question. Reference, I don't know about you, if I were to be a client, if a counsellor were to say to me, I'm going to ask you a rather strange question, what would happen to me? The word strange may get me to be curious. The word strange may get me to be quite anticipatory. Wow, strange question, eh? I want to hear what that is. So what just happened? So the word strange may already facilitate me to want to hear that question, let alone perhaps answering that question along the way. So. The word strange is being added intentionally 
to really prepare the client and to increase the chances of them going along to answer this particular question. Second word that I've added in here is really this word here. Some bits of your imagination. Keyword here is the word bits. So what is so unique about the word bits? Well, when I added the word bits, I wanted this word to give the client some assurance. Why? Why do clients need assurance? It's because usually clients do not like to make a fool of. Clients usually wouldn't want to do something that they will get embarrassed about. So, as I add in the word, some bits of your imagination, I wanted to assure my client that whatever question I'm going to ask you next is not that difficult. It's not that high level. It's not that impossible to answer. All I need from you is just some bits of your imagination and that will do. Got it? And you will find that this particular word, bits, will do a lot of wonders, especially if you have a client who is very unsure of himself or herself, or who has a very low self-esteem, this word bits uh, will go a long way in assuring him or her so that the chances of him or her going along with this question will be a lot higher. So far, are you still with me? Okay. So I leave it to you to try out two ways. Uh. Oh, so the first way, the question, or this particular way. Lah. And you can tell me later on lah, which way seems to work better for you as you try out both ways in your role plays or even in your own uh, counseling practice later on. Okay. All right. okay, moving on quickly. So after I prepared my client, what then do I do? So now I want to ask the miracle question to my client. So very important. First thing to remember is, Whenever you start your miracle question, make sure you use the word suppose or you use the word imagine. Shall I say again? Whenever you start off the miracle question, make sure the first word on the miracle question is either the word imagine or the word suppose. Try your very best to not start off the miracle question with the word if. Why not? Here comes the reason. The word if is a very conditional word. The word if is a very logical word. So if I say, so John, if a miracle were to happen to you, he will say, ah, it will never happen one. Ah. What does happen? So the word if is very conditional, it is very logical. So for us, we want to always be using words which are tentative, which will fit into the groove of imaginative land. And we found that the word imagine and the word suppose, these two words are tentative enough to facilitate clients to be a lot more imaginative. So I, so I say to John, so John, suppose a miracle happens to you. Notice, tentative. John, imagine a miracle happens to you. Once again, tentative. So very important. We always want to choose the right language, the right words to achieve our intention. So over here, we want our client to be imaginative. So we need to choose the right words lah, to accomplish that particular intention. So far, are you still with me? Yeah, move on quickly. So now we come to the most important part lah, of the miracle question. What is the most important part? Well, here comes the most important part. Here. Why? 
Why is this particular part of the question the most important? Well, now comes the explanation. My friends, without this statement, without this particular statement inside the miracle question, what will happen? I can assure you, if we leave out this statement from the miracle question, your client's reply will most likely be unrealistic. Your client's reply will most likely be out of this world. So let me give you, a, me give you an example. Now, uh, when I first started using the miracle question, it was all, all the way in the year 2002 possibly 2003, thereabouts. That's quite a long time ago. So I remember, when I first learned the miracle question, I was so excited. So what did I do? I decided to try it out lah, with almost every client that I saw during that time. And so I remember there was this guy who came to see me. Oh, so let's call him John. So he came to see me. He came to see me mainly because there were some marital problems as well as family problems. That's why he came to see me for counseling. And so I remember after spending quite a bit of time talking to him, I decided to ask him the miracle question. So I said, So John, suppose uh, a miracle happens to you, what will tell you that it happened the next morning when you wake up from your sleep? So guess what? I didn't define what the miracle was. So John looked at me and he said, Well, the first thing that I will notice the next morning will be, I will wake up in my bedroom, I will look up at my ceiling, and I discovered I am staying in a three-story high bungalow situated along 6th Avenue. So I remember, right, when I heard that first reply, I told myself, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> no choice. Started, right? I had to continue. Lah. So I said, okay, so John, what happened next? What will happen next then? Then he told me, Well, Lawrence, what will happen next? I will get out from my bed. I will walk down the three-story uh, high staircase. I will walk out of my living room. And I will be proceeding on to my garage. I said, Okay, what, what will you see in the garage? He told me, Oh, I will see a fleet of eight cars in my garage. By then, I knew lah. <laughs> no longer meaningful. Let's continue. So, okay. Well, what will you do next, John? Well, I will get into my favorite car among the fleet of eight cars. And my favorite car will be a yellow color Lamborghini. So, I will get into the car. I will on the engine. And then I ask, where will you go next? I thought that would turn the tide. No? It didn't. You told me, well... Off I go to Singapore Pools. Why Singapore Pools? He told me, it's because I just strike lottery the weekend before. So I'm going to Singapore Pools to pick up my prize money from the lottery that I just struck over the weekend. Can you all follow me, my friends? What just happened? Well, no doubt about it, these are possibilities. No doubt about it. Problem is, all these possibilities are out of this world. All these possibilities are too far-fetched for them to be accomplished. Can you follow me, my friends? That's the reason why, right? A lot of people, when they are new to the miracle question, they thought, they thought huh? the miracle question is like the three wishes question. So those of you who are Aladdin fans, you probably will know, right? You know, Aladdin, the, the, the genie, you rub, 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 genie come out, then genie will ask you, lah, three wishes for you. My friends, the miracle question is not the three wishes question. The miracle question has a context to it. What's the context? Let me go back to my handout again. Now, this statement again, highlight to you. Yeah.
So, the statement that I just highlighted, this statement provides the context. This statement provides some parameters for your client's imagination. This statement provides some boundaries for your client's imagination so that it will make this whole question a lot more meaningful to answer. Lah. So rather than anything goes, we want our client to be imagining with some realism in mind, with some pragmatism in mind. Okay, follow. That's why this statement is so very important. Up to this point, are you still with me? Okay, continue. Then, another particular phrase is very important in the miracle question. What phrase? Over here. What will be the first small signs? What will be the first small signs? So why? Why is this particular phrase so important within the miracle question? It's because when we ask our client to imagine the first small signs, what are we implying here? We're implying that the first small signs may tend to be more realistic. May tend to be more achievable. May tend to be more down to earth rather than airy fairy. Got it? So, very important. Huh? The miracle question is not just mere imagination alone. We really want our client to be a bit more grounded as they begin to imagine possibilities in their preferred future. Okay, pause for a while. Questions about the miracle question. I'm not done yet. Lah. I'm just taking a pause, just in case you have questions for me. Yeah. Hi, Lawrence. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Mm. Yeah. So I think I asked a similar question before and I think it applies to this miracle question. So mm. how do we construe it such that they won't answer like, oh, if a miracle happened to me, he will come back to me, she will come back to ah, me. Or okay, if, okay. Uh, then, yes. then tomorrow, I don't have to take my mm. level, A level, whatever. Ah, yes, that's right. So how can we make sure right, that we will prevent, uh, to the best that we can, such answers from the client? Good. Thanks, Pauline, for asking that. Now, in my opinion, right, one of the best ways to prevent that kind of answer is how well we do stage number one. I say again. One of the best insurance policy to ensure that clients will give us meaningful answers to a miracle question is how well did we do stage number one? So what do I mean? So if I can invite you to take out your handout one again, the handout one with all the boxes, right? Okay. Now. It might be bring you back again to task 1C. Task 1C. We covered that on Monday. So, task 1C is leverage slash value, isn't it? So, what is the main objective of doing task 1C? Main objective of doing task 1C? Main objective of doing task 1C? To understand more of what's going on. No, good try. Ning. Oh, 1C. No. 1C, 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 1C. Oh. That's 1A, ah, Ning. 1C. That's 1C. Figure out the value. Figure out what the ah, right. ah, That's right. Ah, ah. So 1C is all about what? Helping our clients to prioritize, isn't it? What is the issue that they want us to help them with? Can you follow me, my friends? So now comes the best part. Now, in order for my client to give me meaningful answers, SH2, 
I have to make sure that task 1C is helping my client to choose a realistic issue. Helping my client to choose an issue that's more within his or her control. Can you follow me, my friends? So example, if my client comes in to see me because a loved one passed away. Now, before I bring her to stage 2, I have to make sure that at task 1C, the issue that she wants me to help her with is within her control. Because if I don't do task 1C well, if I were to ask this lady the miracle question, she could tell me, oh, miracle happened, Lawrence. My husband will be alive again. Or my mom-in-law will be alive again. Or my dad will be alive again. Guess what? So now, the answers that's been provided to me is no longer realistic. Can you follow me, my friends? That's why, if you want your client to give you meaningful answers in stage 2, a lot of good work must be done as early as stage 1. That's why every stage will follow through to the next stage. If you want stage 2 to be meaningful, stage 1 has to be done meaningfully. If you want stage 3 to be done meaningfully, stage 2 has to be done meaningfully. So every stage will have huge implication to the results for the next stage. Yes, Jeff, go for it. Mm. Okay, uh, I think uh, it's often true that the client goes back and forth, right? So oh, yes, definitely, for sure. Mm. We may have done like 1C, and we think, okay, it's fine, mm. right? Mm. And you mm. go in. And mm. because the, the, the client, client has slipped back, and uh, that's yes. between sessions, you, you are that's not right. back. Then they Possible. come in and they, they still give that answer, you know, mm. I find my yes. husband to come that's right. back. Life, ah, right? then what do we do? Mm. Then what do we do? Huh? Good. Yeah. Now, if that were to happen to me, I have no qualms in bringing the client back to 1C again. Ah, okay. Ah, so if I may bring you back, let me bring the diagram back to you all. Ah. Okay, diagram. Okay, let me see where my diagram is. Hmm. Oh, yes. Give me, a while, ah. Give me a while, ah. give me a while. Ah. This is the problem when you have too many windows open. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. Okay, you all should see it. Yeah, good. Okay, now, this is where, right, there's a reason why Egan actually used a two-way arrow, isn't it? As you can see here, two-way arrow here, two-way arrow here, isn't it? It's to tell us that while we teach this particular framework in a very linear way, isn't it? Stage one, then stage two, then stage three, in reality, when we use it, more often than not, we go back and forth, like what Jeff says. So for me, if I've done well for task 1C, right here, however, when I take my clients over to task 2A, let's say my client's reply seems to be out of this world seems to be unrealistic, seems to be non-achievable. What do I do? Well, instead of following through with stage 2, I wouldn't do that. I will then take my clients back to 1C again. Why? To re-clarify with him or her what is really the issue that we should be working on together. Can you all follow me, my friends? So that, once the issue is clarified, then I'll take him or her back to 2A, so that stage 2 will now be a lot more meaningful moving forward. Okay? Yeah. So I hope, Pauline, I've answered your question to some extent. So is it going to... Sorry, can I just ask mm, one more? Sure, go for it. Mm. Since we have kind of like identified the issue at once, yes, we have. Can we just mm -hmm. ask them like, you know, what will happen if that problem mm. that we just identified at once is solved? Because you yeah. know, you're like just baiting that 
uh, I don't know whether I would date them uh, if mm. I ask them that and then they just give another answer. Okay, I okay. Remind me again. I I I only heard the word baiting, but I couldn't really hear the the rest of the words. Say that again. Mm. Uh, sorry. So just to mm. review, yeah. So ah. is it okay if we just ask them? Ah, ask um, them what? what mm. is the problem we identified in one C? Uh -huh. Basically, okay. motivation whatever was solved. Yes. And what mm. do you think would happen? Can we just do that instead? Because some clients, mm. you know, mm. have like maybe no imagination. Sure, sure. Well, of course we can do that. Okay. So I will cover that question that you just said under option. Option two. So I'll come back to it later. Oh, okay, okay. Now, some clients, right, you're right in saying that they may not be that imaginative. That's why the miracle question actually caters to this kind of clients. But for some clients, right, who less imagination, they really need a context uh, for them to be imaginative. That's why the word miracle may just help them to really suspend their logical thinking and to really get them to be imaginative. But of course, there'll be some clients uh, who might find the word miracle to be offensive. If that's the case, we can always use option two, three or four uh, to achieve task 2A's objective. We can do that. Okay. Yeah. Other questions so far? Are we okay? Sorry, I'm being a pest again. Uh, uh, yes, go for it. Mm, have yes. you ever had a, a client uh, after you've mm. gone to 2A, yep. uh, then you realize that uh, actually the story mm. has changed, so you have to go back to 1A. Oh, yeah, you know, I, do. I do. I do. I do. In fact, to be honest, Jeff, I don't find that to be a pest. Uh, in fact, Egan will say the same thing as what I would say. Mm. Mm, more often than not, clients don't really know exactly what they want. Mm. To be honest, you see, if we look at our own life, we tend to know what we don't want, mm -hmm. but we normally don't really know that clearly what we want. That's why Egan says it well, clarity evolves. So it's not about whether I know for sure or I don't know for sure. It's more about, hmm, I'm becoming clearer as I talk to my counsellor. I'm becoming a bit more clearer about what I want as the sessions continues. So the whole idea is, right, it will be more helpful for us to think about it in this way, that clarity exists on a scale rather than an either-or thing. Because if we look at clarity as an either-or thing, my friends, I can assure you, you will be very frustrated in this work that we do. First, I can tell you, nine out of ten of my clients, right, we go back and forth. And to me, that is really the norm. To me, that is really what has become expected uh, when I do this kind of work. Because the whole idea is, I want to help them to be clearer in our time together. And clearer doesn't mean that they don't change. It just means that the back and forth may help them uh, to be clearer about, this is really what I want moving forward. Hi Lawrence, um, I yes. have a question. If we go back to yeah. once, and we need to come sure. back to the miracle mm. question, mm. it just yes. feels a bit contrived. I'm not sure how to smoothly mm. come back. You know the question I asked mm. you earlier. Okay. I like, oh. just wanted to mm. actually carry out the process, or do we just go to the next step? Because oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah. Usually, okay. So for example, right, if I've already asked a miracle question, climb give me a reply that's really unrealistic, as I bring him back to 1C, after we clarified the issue already, usually I would just say it this way. I would say, so John, remember the question that I asked you just now? That was quite strange. That involves the miracle. So that I would just say, well, once again, suppose a miracle would happen to you. Da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da -da, so that would be what I would just say. Okay. So in other words, right, I probably wouldn't do the prep work again. All that I would do is remind the client, remember the question that I asked you that involves the miracle? Well, suppose a miracle would happen to you and whatever, 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 what would be the first sign that will tell you that that's happening? So that'll be what I'll do. So in a sense, we persist with it, and the client realizes yeah, we're, going to, we're going to stick to this, so whatever way, you we do, we're going to come back to it in a way. Yes, in a way, you're right. Mm, that's right. Okay, okay. thank yeah, you. That's right. No problem. 
So far, okay? Okay, quickly moving on, ah. Huh? Okay, uh, time, yes. Okay. Hey, hang on, ah. Huh? Okay. Go back to... Okay, so now um, another way to facilitate clients to tell me more meaningful answers to the miracle question is over here. Now, instead of using the generic term, the miracle is that the problem that brought you here is off. I'll prefer to customize this statement to the issue that was agreed upon at task 1C. I say again, huh? instead of using this particular generic term, oh, the miracle is that the problem that brought you here today is solved. Quite generic, right? I prefer to customize this statement to the exact issue that was agreed upon at task 1C. So example, example again. Okay? It might be bringing you back to the chart. So example, let's see if I'm seeing John. Let's say John at task 1C tells me, okay? oh, Lawrence, I want to, I want to, uh, Okay, manage, for example, uh, my depression better. Okay, let's say uh, this is the issue that John wants me to help him with over at task 1C. Okay, what do I do? So now I'm all set to bring John to stage 2, isn't it? And let's say I decided to ask John, the miracle question. So how will I phrase it? Well, same thing. It might be bringing you back to the miracle question. Hand up. Okay, same thing. Okay, I will prep John as per normal. I will say, so John, suppose while you're sleeping tonight, a miracle happens. The miracle is. Now, I wouldn't say to John, the problem that you brought you here is solved. I wouldn't. What would I do? I will now customize this statement to the issue that John wants me to help him with. How would I phrase it? I would say, miracle is that you find yourself managing your depression better. Can you all follow me, my friends? So now what does happen? What does happen is, as I begin to customize this particular statement, my bet is I am channeling my client's imagination to something more specific. And my belief is, as I get my client to imagine something that's more specific, the chances of them telling me answers which are more meaningful, more related, will be a lot higher. All can follow me, my friends. So that's another way, which I found to be very helpful if I want my client to be telling me more specific, more on-point possibilities, which is linked to the issue that they're coming to see me for over at task 1C. Yes, Jeff. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, Lawrence, I noticed, uh, I, mm. yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that ah. you phrase the problem actually mm. in terms of how uh, 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 in terms of the issue, in terms of something that the client has control over. Mm, usually I'll try to do that. So right. Rather than to say, oh, you know, your depression disappears, which, which mm, is like... I got it. So right. otherwise mm. they will come by and say, oh, you know, I, I win the total yeah. top okay, prize. Okay, okay, you got it. That's right. Yes, you're right. Okay, okay. Okay. That's why uh, the way we define the issue at one C is so important. Okay. Because we always want to define it very much as within the client's control rather than something that's fluke la, or something that is based on external forces la, which is beyond their control, basically. Okay, yeah. Okay, quickly moving on. Okay, now, uh, one more thing before I move on from the miracle question. Okay. 
If you are thinking about shortening the miracle question, there's a way of doing it. Let me show you how that, that can be done. Eh? Over here. Now, there's one particular statement within the miracle question that can be omitted lah, if you choose to do so. It's this part here. Okay. So, this statement. Only you don't know that it's solved because you are asleep. So this statement, in my opinion, whether it's there or not, does not really make that big of a difference. So if you want to shorten your miracle question, maybe, just maybe, removing this statement from the miracle question may just help like, to make this question a little bit shorter. If you want to. Okay? Good. Finally, one more thing to remember. Now, even if I were to remove this particular statement, now, the question is still quite long, isn't it? Which means what? Which means, right, as I ask this particular miracle question, I have to make sure that I introduce pauses along the way. Because whenever we ask clients a long question, if we ask it too fast, usually they don't follow. When they don't follow, their mind switch off. When their mind switch off, they normally wouldn't give us any reply, let alone a meaningful reply. So what do we do? So in my opinion, the best way to be introducing pauses is at the punctuation marks. Okay? So, so I'll say to John, ah, so John, suppose that I pause. While you're sleeping tonight, I pause. A miracle happens, I bossed. The miracle is, you are managing your depression better. I pause again, right? What might be the first small signs? I pause again. You notice tomorrow morning, they will tell you that you are managing your depression better. So notice, it's, all, it's always about pausing so that clients are inching towards the question and they are more able to answer it meaningfully as a result of us pausing uh, along the way. So that's always helpful to do so. Okay. Uh, hi, Lawrence. I just have a question. Mm, sure. What, okay. the, mm. what was the reason why they did put originally only you don't know that it is solved because you mm. received? I'm just curious. Okay. Now, they put it there for this particular reason which is they wanted the client, right, to really, the next morning, right, to go about discovering uh, how different the day will be. Uh. So it sort of adds some suspense uh, to the whole question. Ah, so like, we didn't know, no? Ah, so, so it's like... like it's, it's, it's like a clean slate, and then you wake up fresh day, and then... Yeah, then you... and how will you go about discovering uh, that something happened to you the night before, kind of thing. So I think it's, uh, it's like a very nice way of leading the client to really think seriously about how different will they be because of the miracle that they were not aware about. So it's really just to help them to be even more your, imaginative, hopefully. Mm. In your experience, you didn't see it making much of a difference? Um, if you ask me, right, it might be a slight difference, but I do not think the difference is that great, to be honest with you. Okay, thank yeah. you. So, mm, cool. Yeah. Okay, huh? quickly move on. Now, you're probably going to ask me, so Lawrence, uh, what happens if, Eva, some clients may find the word miracle to be offensive? Possible, isn't it? So I remember when I first learned about the miracle question, I thought, I thought, uh, that Steve and Insu, they were religious people. Because I'm sure all of us know, right, that the word miracle is being used more often in some religion and not so much in other religion. So at first I thought, uh, Steve and Insu, when they threw in the word miracle, I thought, it was because they were religious people. But I discovered that they were not. So now, if you feel that the word miracle might offend your client, what do you do? My proposal for you is, maybe you may not want to ask the miracle question. Instead, you may want to use option two. Option two. Option two, we call it future probes. The word probes here just refers to 
questions. Right? And so you'll find that all the questions over here in this handout, I gotten it from the Egan Skilled Helper book. So come, let's, let's, let's go through that together, shall we? Come. So I provided for you five questions under future probes. Right? Now, if you do, do a comparison between the five questions for option two and option one, the miracle question, what seems to be the major difference that you will find? Well, in my opinion, the major difference between future probes and the miracle question is, for future probes, the questions here, they are a lot more down to earth. They are a lot shorter. They are a lot more pragmatic as opposed to the miracle question under option one. Can you follow me, my friends? So this is where, right, for clients who might be more pragmatic, clients who might be a bit more rational, maybe, yeah? maybe, just maybe, option two might just be a better fit for them, rather than the miracle question. Got it? Now, same thing. If I were to be you, right, even if I were to be using option two, future probes, I will still want to customize my future probe questions to the issue, the exact issue that my client wants me to help him with under task 1C. So what do I mean? Let's try this out together. Let's say, for example, I decided to ask John uh, question 3. How would I phrase it? This would be how I'll phrase it. So I say, so John, what would life be like if you are managing your depression better? Notice? So I'm what? I'm customizing this third question based on the issue under task 1C. Can you all follow me, my friends? Another example, huh? let's see if I decided to use question one. Right? I will ask it this way. So John, what would life be like if you are managing your depression better? Same thing. So I will want to customize question one, future probe, based on the issue under task 1C, so that by doing that, I trust that my client will give me meaningful replies because I'm getting him to be imagining based on something more specific rather than something that is way too generic. Okay? So put it very simply for you is this. Uh, whether you use option one or two, the trick is make sure your question is based on the exact issue that was agreed upon under task 1C. So that's really what I found to be very helpful uh, if you want such two to be done more meaningfully. Okay. okay. Now let me answer just question about insomnia. Insomnia. Uh, will this question work? Uh? It will. So this is what I'll do. Now, if my client at task 1C tells me that he wants to resolve his insomnia problem. He wants to be able to sleep better at night. What would I do? This is what I'll do. I may still choose to use the miracle question. But now, right, this will be how I'll phrase it. I'll phrase it this way. So I'll say, so John, suppose a miracle happens to you. The miracle is you are now able to fall asleep during night time. And then I will say, what might be the first small signs that will tell you that things are different before you fall asleep? My friends, you probably will know by now, right? That people who have insomnia problems, sometimes it's because of what they do before they sleep, what they do during their sleep, and what they do if they were to be awakened from their sleep. So what I want to do is, 
I want to get John to tell me possibilities relating to what happened before he sleeps, what happened as he gets himself to sleep, and what happens if he were to wake up, how can he get himself back to sleep? So this will be what I want him to imagine. So there will literally be a few scenes that I want him to imagine as a result of the miracle question that I'll be asking him on. Or Jeff, so I hope that that will probably be what I will do it, basically, or how I will do it. Okay, yeah. Okay, let me just pause for a while. Any questions for me about option one, two, three, and four for task 2A? Hope I was clear. Okay, ah? Okay, can. Okay, so now, now, ah, I'm going to take us to task 2B. Uh, I'm mindful of time, ah? We'll go for break at 815. Sorry, ah? I'm mindful about the time. Okay, so let's, let's do that. Okay. First, let me share a screen with you about task 2B. Okay, let me bring it down. Okay. Now, let me first draw your attention to two very important words under task 2B. And the two very important words are here. The word shape and the word choose. So I say again, the two very important words for task 2B are the word shape and the word choose. And my friends, these two words are not from me. These two words are actually from Egan. So if you ever were to read through Egan's book, you'll discover that he keeps going back to these two words when he wrote the chapter on task 2B. Okay? So now let me share with you lah, why these two words are so important lah, to Egan. Now, Egan says that when we are doing uh, task 2A with clients, okay, go back again, task 2A, right? Now, Usually, task 2A is to provide a stimulus for clients to start to think about possibilities. And more often than not, right, when clients are thinking about possibilities, the possibilities they generate tends to be rather broad, tends to be rather vague. Got it? So I say again, ah? so normally Egan says, when we are doing task 2A with any client, right? usually as they are brainstorming possibilities, as they are answering the miracle question, as they are answering the future probes, usually the possibilities generated tends to be rather broad, tends to be rather vague. And this is to be expected lah, by Egan. That's why he said, lah, and I tend to agree. And he says, when we bring the clients to task 2B, we then need to help our clients to shape. So the keyword here, shape. So what do we need to help our clients to shape? Well, we need to help our clients to shape the broad goals to shape their vague goals to become more clear and more specific. So I say again, ah? so Egan says that when we bring clients from task 2A over to task 2B, our number one priority is to help our clients to shape. Shape what? Shape their broad goals. To shape their broad possibilities to become specific goals. To shape their vague 
possibilities to become clearer goals. Got it? So that is really the main objective, lah. Why we are doing task to be. So you're probably gonna ask me, right? So Lawrence, how do we go about doing that, isn't it? Now, now I'm gonna share with you a particular case study. I felt that the best way for me to illustrate to you lah, the difference between 2A, 2B, and whatever not is probably through a case study. Lah. So I'm going to share with you a case study. Now, I'm afraid I can't uh, make the case study available to you because it's actually a client that I saw. Of course, I make some changes to the details of it. Lah. But um, as I show you this particular um, what information, right? Yeah, so uh, it's just for help us to understand lah, the task A, 2A, and 2B. Lah. But yeah, so sorry that I'm not able to make it available to you. Okay, good. Okay, come quickly now. Let me just share with you the case study. Okay, good. Let me make it smaller so you can see more details in one page. Mm. Okay, so climb. Let me just call him Peter. So Peter was about 40 when he came to see me for counseling. Okay. Um, Peter was married. I used the word was because Mary, unfortunately, passed away about nine months ago due to breast cancer. Okay. So I remember when Peter came to see me, he came in to see me mainly for this issue. What issue? He came in mainly to see me because of Marissa's passing la, about nine months ago due to breast cancer. Now, Peter and Mary, they have two lovely children. Mark, age 10, and John, age 8. Okay. So, I remember as I began to see Peter for sessions, right? I spent quite a bit of time really allowing him to tell me his story. So in other words, I spent quite, I think, easily about what? Two sessions, I think, just letting him tell me about his story. I remember, lah, so Peter went to the extent of telling me how, they, how he and Mary met. He told me quite a lot about all the good times they shared, all the pleasant memories they shared. Uh, spent a bit of time telling me about uh, uh, how uh, courageous Mary fought uh, her cancer. So basically, Mary was diagnosed with breast cancer, if I'm not wrong, uh, two years before she passed. Right? And she fought. Uh, so she went through a couple of rounds of chemo, you know, radiation, went for surgery and all that. Yeah, but ultimately, uh, she succumbed to breast cancer. Uh, ultimately. So I remember for those sessions, it was really for Peter to tell me. Uh, all the good times, how they met, pleasant memories, how much she missed her, um, how they fought through cancer, remission, and whatever not. And eventually, she passing on. Okay. Yeah. And as we were talking about her, his story, right, I began to find out from Peter that when Mary passed nine months ago, her passing actually began to affect Peter in quite a few aspects of his life. First aspect, himself. So Peter began to tell me uh, that ever since Mary's passing, right, he finds himself feeling very sad often. He finds himself isolating. He finds himself lacking energy and motivation uh, to do almost everything uh, in life. So that was on himself. And Peter went on to say that not only was he himself affected, his children, in particular his sons, were also affected due to Mary's passing. How so? He says, well, Peter finds himself becoming very impatient with his two sons, especially during uh, meal times. Peter said to me uh, that when the wife was still around, right, Meal times was always a joy. You know, they would crack jokes, you know, they will, you know, they will tease each other, you know. So a lot of pleasant memories over meal times. Lah. But once Mary passes, Peter said to me, meal times now becomes 
literally a war zone. Why? Peter finds himself very short-fused. He finds himself quick to judge, quick to find fault, rather than to be the light-hearted father like he used to be when the wife was still alive. In fact, Peter went on to tell me like, that his two sons now fears him more than enjoys his company. Like. So that was what Peter uh, mentioned to me. Yeah. Continue. Peter also said that his wife's passing also affected his work quite a fair bit. How? Now, Peter was working as a sales manager, regional sales manager. Like. So he had a team of people that he was uh, managing. Right? And he told me like, that ever since his wife passed on, what happens? He has not been meeting his sales target for the last, I think, two to three quarters. Like, to the point where top management actually gave him a warning letter uh, telling him, uh, if you still don't buck up, we might have to let you go. If you still don't buck up, we might have to dismiss you altogether. So in other words, there was a lot on the line uh, if Peter do not get his act together. Uh. And so there was a lot on the line. So after spending a good two sessions listening to his story, right, we decided to move to task 1C. Here, leverage. And this was the issue that Peter wanted me to help him with. What was the issue? Here. He wanted me to help him better manage his grief over his beloved wife's passing. So that was this issue, lah that he wanted me to help him with. Up to this point, all still with me? Okay, huh? okay. now let me demonstrate to you, okay? How did I went on to do task 2A and 2B lah, with Peter? And you'll see a difference as I begin to use this case study to illustrate that to us. Okay, so this is what I did. I decided to ask Peter the miracle question. Why? Because I knew that Peter was a Christian. And I knew that Christians and Catholics, we believe in the idea of miracles. So I decided uh, to go along to ask Peter the miracle question. So I said, so Peter, you know, suppose you know, we go home tonight, fall asleep, a miracle happens to you. The miracle is you find yourself better able to manage your grief over your beloved wife's death. What would be the first small signs that will tell you that that's happening to you? Now, Peter began to tell me broad, broad possibilities. He said, well, Lawrence, I suppose I would notice that I will be a very involved father once again. What did he say? I will be a very involved father. Okay, let me tap it up for you. Ah. So it's the case I'll help you out. So he said, I will be So I will be a very involved father once again. Now, this particular statement, in my opinion, is relevant. No doubt about it. But Egan would say, this statement, while it's relevant, is rather broad. It's rather vague. Why? It's because a very involved father could mean different things to different people, isn't it? So, what else? He tells me, Still at 2A, uh, 2A okay? he tells me, well, right, I will regain back some of my energy and zeal for life. Once again, Egan will say, this statement, good. Good start. This statement is a broad possibility. 
is a rather vague possibility, but is definitely relevant to the issue lah, at task 1C. No doubt about it. But it's vague, it's rather broad. What else did Peter tell me? After asking the miracle question, he says, well, I will be a better manager and motivator to my <coughs> sales team. Once again, Eagle would say, relevant, but broad possibility, rather vague possibility. Okay, follow me so far, my friends. Continue. Then Peter continued to tell me more. He says, well, Lawrence, miracle happened, right? Well, he says, uh, I will start, okay, he said, uh, I will start to socialize again. And mixed around with people again. Once again, Egan would say, this is a good start, but it's rather broad, it's rather vague. So guess what? So now, my job is to now take Peter to task 2B. So how? How can I now ask Peter to shape all these broad possibilities to become specific? How can I help Peter to begin to shape all these vague possibilities to become more specific? Well, I have to ask Peter questions, isn't it? So this is where, right, if you look at the Egan's book, Egan has a go-to question that he always asks. <laughs> he always will ask, how would it look like? Always one. Uh. So let me apply that here. So I actually asked Peter, I said, so Peter, you mentioned that you will be a very involved father. So I said, hang on, huh? So I said, how will being an involved father look like for you? What will tell you, Peter, that you are becoming an involved father again? So what's happening here? As I ask Peter these two questions, how will being an involved father look like for you? What will tell you that you are becoming a very involved father again? What am I doing? What I'm doing now is I'm trying to break down the very involved father to become more clear and specific. Okay, follow me, my friends. Because the term a very involved father can mean different things to different people. So I'm interested to know what is the version that Peter hold on to rather than for me to assume that I know or to impose my version onto Peter. Can you all follow me, my friends? After that, what did I do? Then I ask, hmm. so Peter, you mentioned, right, that you regain back some of your energy and zeal for life. Same thing. When you are regaining back this energy, when you are regaining back this zeal for your life, how will that look like for you? What will you find yourself doing? How will you know that you are regaining back this zeal? How will you know that you are regaining back this motivation, this energy for life? Same thing. So I'm now making this particular broad goal this particular vague goal to become clearer and more specific. Similar, when I get to the work part, same thing. Oh, Peter, you mentioned, right, that you will now become what? A better manager. Whoa. A more solid motivator to your sales team. Hmm. How will that look like for you? What will tell you that you are now a better manager to them? What will tell you that you are a good motivator in motivating them to accomplish the sales goal 
quarter that you felt as a team individually and as a team for the last three quarters. Same thing. So I want to make this particular broad goal to become specific, this particular vague goal to become a lot more specific. And finally, I asked Peter, so Peter, when you mentioned that you will now start to socialize again, you will start to mix around with people again. How will that look like for you? Who? Who will you find yourself mixing around again? Who might you be hanging out with again? So guess what? So now it's about, once again, making this particular broad goal, this particular vague goal, to become clearer as well as more specific. Can you all follow me, my friends, so far? So now can you see the difference between task 2A and 2B? 2A is where we just want to get our clients to be stimulated to tell us possibilities. Whether they tell us broad, specific, it's okay. As long as it is relevant uh, to the issue at task 1C, we'll take it. But when we move them to task 2B, this is where we really want to help our clients to move from broad and vague goals to become clear and specific goals. So that, so that, that will help our clients to be more motivated to chart their course to achieve la, this clear and more specific goals. Okay, that's what we're trying to do, basically. Okay. Okay, so far, can you all see the difference between the two? Task 2A and Task 2B. Any quick questions, comments for me? Yes, go for it, uh, Darini. Mm. Um, do we wait for them to say everything, all the answers, ah, before okay. we go in? Good question, good question. Now, usually, Darini, Egan will probably tell me, lah, try to get them to say everything. Meaning, ah, because, like I said just now on Monday, right? When we are helping clients to brainstorm at Task 2A, right? We wouldn't want to break their momentum. So, generally for me, same thing to Egan. I normally would just want my client to rattle on uh, all the possibilities out there. Uh, and then I'll bring them to task B after that. But I can almost imagine there will be other people who do differently from me. Uh, but I think Egan will probably say it's better to not break the flow. Uh, so it means we do go broad, then we go narrow after that. Let them purge everything out. You got it. <laughs> well, purge everything out. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Time check, 8.20 now. If you can be back by 8.30, we'll continue to learn more about 2B as well as 2C. So see you guys in 10 minutes. Okay, let me just continue for one more. Then I'll invite some questions if you have one. Okay. Okay, just in case you're wondering, where am I on the handout? Let me point it out to you. Mm -hmm. I am here. This part here. Goals should be clear and specific. So this is where I am. Okay, good. Now, let me go back again to what I typed just now. Now, sometimes, right, another way for us to help clients to make broad goals to become specific, to make or to shape vague goals to become specific is by asking from other people's point of view. Let me give you some examples, okay? Now, going back again to this idea about Peter wanting to be a more involved father, right? What can I do? Besides me asking from Peter's point of view, what will tell him that he's becoming a more informed father? I can also ask from his two sons' opinion, isn't it? So, let me go back to refresh your memory. <clears throat> yeah. So, I called the two sons, Mark, as well as John. Right? So, besides me asking Peter from his point of view, what will tell him that he's a more involved father, I can also ask from Mark's point of view as well as John's point of view. 
So how can I ask it? Well, I can say, so uh, Peter, you know, what, what might Mark say? What might Mark notice about you? They will tell him that daddy is a lot more involved. What might John notice different about you? They will tell him that daddy is now more involved in our life. So in other words, right? So I do not just want to get John's, Peter's perspective alone. I also want to be getting from the two sons' perspective what will tell them that Peter is now a more involved father than before. Got it? Another example, you might go back to my whiteboard again. This part here. Right. He, Peter said he wanted to be a more, a better manager as well as a better motivator to his sales team. Same thing. Besides me asking from Peter's point of view, I can also ask, oh, okay. So Peter, if I have the chance to ask your sales team, what might they tell me about the differences they will notice about you? That you are now a better motivator to them, you are now a better manager to them. Once again, I'm not just asking from Peter's point of view, I'm also asking from his sales team's point of view. Can you follow me, my friends, on that? Now, the last one. I can also ask, socialize. So I can say, oh, so Peter, um, who might be some people that would say that you are once again socializing more? Who might be some people that would say that you are now mixing around more than before? So same thing, not only am I asking Peter's point of view, I'm also asking from other important people's point of view as well. So by asking in this way, I'm also trying to make all the broad goals to become more specific, all the vague goals to become clearer as a result of that. Okay, all right. Okay. Any questions for me about the clear and specific goals but for task to be? Okay, huh? good. So now let me cover the other dimensions within task to be. Yeah, in case you're wondering what they are. Oh, sorry. I think I off my video accidentally. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, let me go back to my handout. Okay. My friends, you're probably wondering, right? So, Lawrence, okay, we understand uh, what you mean by goals should be clear and specific. We understand. But how about the other criteria? Here. So, what do you mean, Lawrence? My goals must make a difference in clients' life. What do you mean, Lawrence, when you say goals should be realistic? What do you mean, Lawrence, when you say goals should be prudent? What do you mean when you wrote here that goals should be consistent with their values? What do you mean when you say goals should be set in a reasonable time frame? Now let me cover all the other criteria for all of us. So here we go. Now, let's say we manage to make all the vague goals to become clear. We manage to make all the broad goals to become more specific. Now, can you imagine? In Peter's mind, there are many, many goals, isn't it? In Peter's mind, there are many, many, many specific goals. There are many, many, many clear goals. But now, we need to get Peter to what? To choose. So, the shaping is already done. So, the shaping is accomplished when we make goals to become clear and specific. So, this is where, right? The shaping part is being done. So, once the shaping of the goals is being done, we now move the client to the choosing part. So I say again, uh, the shaping of the goals happens when we make clients' goals becomes clear and specific. So once the shaping is done, we now move the client to the choosing part. The choosing part. So, I don't know about you, but for me, 
Whenever I want to choose something or some things, it will help a lot if there are certain criteria that will help me to be more informed in my choice, isn't it? So this is where, right? Whatever that you see here, 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 and here, all these five criteria may actually help Peter to choose. May actually help Peter to be able to choose out of so many specific goals, out of so many clear goals, which are the goals that I want to be achieving right now. So this is where, right, the choosing might be facilitated when we get Peter to be thinking about all these five criteria. So how will I go about helping Peter then? Once again, I need to be asking Peter a series of questions. So here goes. So I will say, so Peter, after telling me all the goals, about how you'll be a more involved father, how you will be regaining back energy and zeal for your life, how you are now becoming a better motivator and manager to your sales team, how you are now socializing more with your friends. Hmm, I wonder, out of all these goals that just told me, which ones, which of these goals seems to be realistic for you to achieve right now. Notice? So now, as I ask Peter about the realistic criteria, I'm helping him to choose. Out of so many goals I just told Lawrence, which ones would be considered more realistic for me to target at? Which goals would be considered more realistic for me to want to work towards? I could even ask, so Peter, out of all these goals they just told me, which goals seems to fit with your values the most? Which goals seems to be most consistent with what is important to you right now? So once again, I can ask this question. And as Peter figure out, ah, this goal, more fitting to my values, that goal, not so fitting, it helps him to better able to choose which are the goals that he wants to be putting into his change agenda. Another one I could also ask. So Peter, out of all these goals that you told me, which are the goals that are considered more prudent for you to want to achieve now? My friends, the word prudent is, means wise. And usually, when we use the word prudent, we can't help but think a bit more Long term. Think a bit more larger picture, isn't it? So I'll say that. So Peter, out of all these goals they just told me about, which are the goals which you say will be the most prudent, the wisest goals that they should be achieving right now, looking at both short term and also the larger scheme of things. So that could be a question that I can ask that can address the prudent criteria. I can also ask Peter, so Peter, out of all these goals that you told me about, hmm, which particular goals, if you were to achieve them, it will make the biggest difference uh, to your life. So that will address the, the criteria of making a difference in Peter's life. So I can also ask that. And finally, I can also ask, so Peter, out of all these goals you just told me about, which particular goals would you say has the most reasonable time frame uh, that you can be achieving right now. So now I'm asking more about the time frame as well. Got it? So this is where, right, Egan says it well in his book, uh, that after we help clients to shape their goals to become clearer and specific, we need to help clients to choose. We have to help clients to select out of all these goals, which are the ones that I really want to aim to achieve now? Which are the ones that I really want to work towards now? And this is where la, helping them to think through all these criteria may help them la, to better able to choose and select which are the more important goals that they want to be working towards right now. 
Okay, I pause for a while. Not done yet. Pause for a while. Invite some questions. Am I clear so far? Now, very important. The five criteria that you saw in the handout, right? Egan says, sometimes there's no need for us to ask all five criteria. What does he mean? He says, for some clients, perhaps three out of five criteria might be more important to client A. For client B, it could be out of the five criteria, only two criteria are more important than the other three. So in other words, right, for different clients, different criteria might be more appealing or less appealing. So this is where uh, we have to be able to be flexible enough to ask different criteria because for some criteria, the client might say, well, Lawrence, uh, I'm not that concerned about whether the goals uh, fit my values or not. So it tells you what? That the criteria about consistent with values may not be that important for client A. But for client B, it might be more important. Another example, client uh, Peter might say, hey, Lawrence, uh, actually, yeah, uh, uh, the realistic criteria, mm, very important. No? I need to make sure that the goals that I choose, whoa, they are really realistic for me to achieve now. So guess what? The realistic criteria becomes more meaningful for Peter to use to help him to choose goals uh, moving forward. So this is where uh, we have to be able to be flexible, to be able to adapt uh, so that task 2B will really be a good way of helping clients to narrow down. What are the goals that they want to be achieving as they come to see us for counseling? Okay. Okay. Questions for me about task to be. Hi again. Um, yes, I really how do you yes. exercise your discretion? If somebody is very logical, ah, do you tend yes. to encourage ah, more but, time? Mm, yes, or is it better right. to actually use the other kind of things just to see what else comes up? Mm, good question. That we need. Okay, let me just share with you all about my go-to criteria. Okay? Not that mine is the best, but let me just share with you based on my experience. Okay, let me go back to the list again. Okay. Now, for me, for me, eh, I tend to put values last. Because I feel that values is something that is more macro. And to be honest, a lot of people, they might have already lost track of what are the important values in their life. So I guess for me, I always want to ask criteria which are a bit easier for the client to consider rather than to be asking criteria that will stretch them way too much. Because if I were to ask them criteria that stretch them too much, rapport might be affected. And before I know it, momentum might be slowed down as well. So this is the order that I typically will flow. First, I will normally go with the... This one. Which goals will make the biggest difference to your life? Why? Because I'm a firm believer la, that usually what will make us choose something over another thing is when by me choosing this goal, it will impact my life the most. It will give me the greatest payoff. It will give me the greatest impact. So I tend to go with the difference uh, criteria first, usually for me. Then I will go with the realistic criteria. Because difference is one thing, but is it realistic? Is it achievable? So now I want to stretch my client to really be thinking about the doability. Can you really do it? Can you really work towards it? So it's really balancing between greatest payoff and the achievableness of it, basically. So these are my top two. Now, in my opinion, the prudent criteria I put it in the same category as the values criteria. Because prudency, once again, uh, is about macro picture. It's about what is considered wise, what is considered discerning. In my opinion, sometimes when clients are too confused, if you ask them, 
what is considered prudent, they'll look at you la, and they will look even more lost than before. So in my opinion, I will normally put prudency together with the value category to, towards the tail end. So after I've asked about the difference criteria followed by the realism criteria, I will normally then go to the time factor criteria. Ah, and maybe, maybe not, I will then ask about prudency. Maybe, maybe not, then I will ask about values. But these are my top three, if you ask me. Difference, realism, followed by the <coughs> um, time frame criteria. Yeah, so these are my top three, generally. So once again, no pressure to follow my, my style, but this has been the three la, that I normally will go to, usually. Yeah. Thanks, Narini. Good question to ask. <laughs> Other questions about task to be? Am I clear so far? Okay, uh, I'll move on. Okay, so after I've completed task 2A followed by task 2B, what do we then do? Now we come to the final task within stage 2. In my opinion, the final task of stage 2 is a very, 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 very important one. I'll tell you why it's important in a moment. Come, let's do it together. Oops, sorry, I off my... Okay. Okay, so here we go. Can I just get you to read show? Task 2C, and we'll talk about it. Okay, let's talk about it. Now, why did I say that task 2C is a very, 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 very important task within stage 2? It's because, in my opinion, task 2B is actually a... a Reality check. So I say again, task 2C is actually a reality check. A reality check about what? About whether should we bring the client to say Shri or should we not? So I say again, huh? in my opinion, Task 2C is a very, very, very important task within H2. Why? It's because Task 2C is actually a reality check. To check on whether is it meaningful to bring our clients to H3 or should we stay at H2 or even backpedal to H1. Now let me explain to you what do I mean. My friends, task 2C is about assessing clients' commitment. Assessing clients' commitment in wanting to achieve the goals at to be. So, my friends, if your client tell you, oh, Lawrence, uh, actually, yeah. Uh, my commitment in wanting to achieve these goals that I just told you about uh, is very low. It tells you what? It tells you that it will be meaningless to bring your client to stage 3. Because stage 3 is all about what? How are you going to achieve the goals? So if I were to tell you, I'm not even that committed uh, in wanting to achieve these goals. If you ask me, so Lawrence, how are you going to achieve these goals? I'll probably say to you, it doesn't matter. You follow? That's why task 2C is so important because it will tell us whether stage 3, whether is it a meaningful stage to go to or not. Got it? So this literally becomes a check lah, for us before we decide moving forward is good or should we stay put or should we go backwards is better. So that's something that is important to do. Okay, so how? How then can we go about checking on our client's commitment? Well, as you can see here, I've given us quite a lot of questions to think about. Okay. So you can ask your client, oh, so Peter, 
How ready? How ready are you? Right? In wanting to achieve these goals that you told me about. So you can ask about the readiness. Or you can ask how badly. Right? So how badly, Peter, do you want to be achieving these goals that you told me a moment ago? So how badly? You can ask that. Or you can also ask, Peter, how hard are you willing to work towards making these goals a reality? You can also ask, how hard are you willing? You can do that as well. Now, if you ask me, I will say to you, my go-to task 2C question is actually the last one. I normally prefer to ask about commitment on a scale. So I say again, I normally prefer to ask about commitment on a scale. So how would I phrase it? Well, I phrase it for you here already. So I said, let's say if I were to be talking to Peter. So this is Peter, on a scale of 0 to 10, right? 0 refers to that you are not at all committed to achieve these goals, and 10 stands for you are very, very, very committed in achieving these goals. What number would you choose la, to best represent your current commitment level? So in my opinion, this is always my go-to task to see question. Why? It's because as a client myself, I normally prefer my counsellor to give me more choices rather than to bulldoze me la, or to force me to tell him or her how hard I want to try or how badly do I want something. I normally don't like that. I prefer to be given more choices. And number two, as a counsellor, I always like to look at most things on a continuum rather than an either or thing. Because in my opinion, a continuum perspective is usually a lot more realistic rather than having an either or perspective, which in my opinion tends to be a bit too unrealistic. That's why for me personally, I always prefer to ask a scaling question. So now comes the best part. So if I may draw a scale for you, 0 to 10, right? So of course we have 1 all the way to 9, right? So if your client happens to tell you a very low number. So low, what do I mean by low? Ah? It could be any number that is from 2 la, and below. Now what do you do? First, don't panic. You know the t-shirt that we always see people wear? Keep calm and, isn't it? Ah. So first thing, if a client gives you a low number, keep calm. Keep calm. Ah. Keep calm and ask more. Okay. So what would I do? So if Peter tells me, oh, Lawrence, ah, I guess I will give a two, lah, a two. What do I do? First, I will ask, oh, so Peter, what led you to give a two and not other numbers? So let's say Peter tells me, well, Lawrence, ah, I think ah, while these goals are important, no doubt about it, I really, really don't know whether am I ready lah, to achieve these goals or not. So it tells you what? It tells you the criteria that I ask at task to be, I may have to ask them again. So I say again. So whatever reason my client tell me about why he chose this low number, I may have to backpedal again, back to to be to do more work. So example, Peter say, I'm not sure whether am I ready you know, to achieve these goals. It might tell me what? It might be about realism. It might even be about time frame. So what do I do? So I will ask, oh, so Peter, so could I just bring you back lah, to the goals that you told me lah, earlier on that you feel that you want to achieve for now? So what I'll, what I'll do, I'll summarize to him. Lah. Well, we talk about goal A, goal B, goal C, goal D, all the way until goal F. Hmm. So when you say, Peter, they are not sure whether are you ready to achieve these goals. Are you referring to all of them? Are you referring to just some of them? 
So now, what am I doing? Now I'm really squeezing Peter to tell me more about the difficulty. I'm squeezing Peter to tell me more about what is it really about. Why is he not that committed in wanting to achieve the goals? So it could end up that we may have to do some fine-tuning work on the time frame. So I may say, so Peter, would it be helpful if for goal A to D, time frame, maybe we can work towards, maybe by next week, maybe D, E, and F, maybe a month later, will that be considered realistic enough, time frame, doable for you? Notice? So now, as I back pedal back to 2B, I'm making the choices of the goals to become once again more meaningful. Can you all follow me, my friends, so far? That's why, once again, uh, the back pedaling uh, to the earlier task becomes something that has become a norm uh, for most of us who use Egan quite a lot in our work. Now sometimes, right, you might get some more shocking answers. Uh. Sometimes, can I might tell you, well, Lawrence, uh, I chose a one because uh, upon thinking hard and good uh, about the goals that I told you just now, hmm, I don't really think that this is the kind of future that I want, Lawrence. You know, after you help me to think more about my future, I come to realize, no, this might not really be the kind of future that I desire. What just happened? What that means is, now, I may have to bring my client back to stage one. Because, guess what? I've gotten my client to think about the future. As he thinks about the future, he becomes clearer about what he wants now. Isn't it? Can you follow me, my friends? And as he becomes clearer about what he wants now, it's, always, it's only fair for me to bring him back to stage one, to then ask him, Oh, so, Peter, so now that you are a bit clearer about what you want now, what might that be? So he might tell me, well, Lawrence, I suppose maybe now I should be working more on um, um, what? saying goodbye to Mary. You know? Of course, lah, I want to be a better father, no doubt. Of course, I want to keep my job, no doubt. Of course, I want to socialize, no doubt. But I think I probably need to find closure. I probably had to seek forgiveness because I wasn't really that good of a uh, uh, that good of a husband towards Mary, especially at the tail end of her life. Mm. I think I need to work on uh, forgiving myself. I need to learn to work on how can I let go of my regrets. So guess what? So now, Peter now has what? A new issue under task 1C. And now, as I once again check in with Peter, whether is that the issue at task 1C? If he tells me yes, what do I do? Same thing. I can now move Peter back to task 2A. How? I can say. So Peter, mm, how will your life be like when you are forgiving yourself more? When you are letting go of your regrets more? So now, I'm getting Peter to imagine a future where he has forgiven himself more. A future where he's letting go of his regrets more. Can you follow me, my friends, on that? And that came about because I asked the commitment scale. And from there, I realized that the issue has changed. I go back to task 1C, re-clarify the issue. I bring Peter back again to task 2A lah, to get him to imagine that 2A picture again. Same thing, 2B will come, and then I'll ask the 2C question again. Okay, that's why 2C is so important because it will tell us whether is it meaningful to go to say 3 or should we do something else? Okay. Pause for Questions for me about 2C? Lawrence, um, yes, thank you. Mm. What, what, what if after you you explore and then you realize that it's because when you uncover the perspective, mm. it wasn't... So do we go all the way back? Oh yeah, there? I would. If it's, if, it's, if it's needed, I would. Okay. If it's needed, I would. Mm, that's right. So it could be all the way back to 1B. 
For example, let's say if there are certain faulty thinking that he has, it might be all the way to 1B. It could be that. So in other words, right, I do not want to restrict myself lah, that I can only go back to 1C. No. I want to keep my options available. So whatever that will help to make our journey more meaningful, I'll bring the client back generally. Other questions so far about 2C? Okay, now let me go back. Huh? What happens if your client were to give you a super duperly high number? Okay, let me go back again. Huh? Okay, let me draw the, the, <coughs> the scale again. Two by nine, this one will be a one. What happens if your client, right? Upon you asking him or her the commitment skill, he tells you, Whoa, I'm at a nine. <laughs> I'm at an eight, you know, or a ten or whatever, right? So what do you do, ah? My friends, here is my view. Whenever my client gives me a super ultra high number on the commitment skill, what I want to do is I always want my client to, excuse me, justify to me. Oh, so Peter, you gave a nine on the commitment skill. Could you once again tell me why? Why are you so committed? Why are you willing to work so hard to achieve all these goals? Why? Why would I want Peter to justify to me? Where is all the commitment coming from? Why? It's because as Peter once again tell me la, the why, why is he so committed? I hope as he tells me about the why, it will further consolidate his commitment. It will further consolidate his motivation in wanting to achieve these particular goals. So, I always believe in this. The more we justify about something, the more likely we will carry out that something. Isn't it? So the more I talk about why am I committed, the more likely I will see through the commitment. The more I tell you about why I'm willing to work so hard, the more likely I will see through the working hard part. So same thing here. So if my client gets a super high number, I want him to justify to me where is all this commitment coming from so that the more he tells me about that, I hope that his commitment level becomes ultra high, moving towards this tree. I know questions for stage two before I move down to stage three. Okay, huh? good. Let's go, let's go to stage three then. Okay, let me just uh, go back to the, the slides. Mm -hmm. It's probably clever to use the handout. Okay. Mm, yes, correct. Okay, so we come again for us. What the Egan calls a sweep? He calls a sweep the way forward. The way forward. My friends, the easiest way to distinguish. Stage two and three is just by one word. La. What is the one word? One word is here. For stage two, the emphasis is always on the what word. Meaning, what do I want? What do I want? So that is always stage two. La. The what. What do I want? Stage three, we are always asking the how word. How do I get what I want? How do I make what I want a reality? How can I reach my destination? Got it? So that is always how we distinguish 
Stage two and stage number three. Stage two is always about the what? Stage three is always about the how. Got it? Okay? Okay, moving on. Now, Gerard Egan has a particular bias uh, when he talks about stage three. What is the bias here? Well, to Gerard Egan, he says, stage three, he used the word strategies, isn't it? So, Egan says, stage three, he tends to want to focus on action strategies. Means, uh, he tends to want to get clients to think about what can they do, right? How can they go about doing so that their goals at stage two can be achieved, right? How can the client go about behaving? How can the client go about doing so that their goals at stage two can be accomplished? So Egan says, very clearly in his book, lah, that he tends to steer more towards strategies which are action oriented. What he believes lah, that when we take action, more often than not, our goals will be accomplished. When we take action, more likely than not, our goals will be achieved, basically. So that's, that's his bias lah, generally. Okay? All right. So let me now invite uh, Zana to upload <coughs> handout number seven. Zana. Issue, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you. Turn out seven. Yeah. Okay, sending in the Zoom chat now. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So once again, you can download this handout either through the link or through the Zoom group chat, which is going to be available soon. Yeah. Ah, it's there already. So you will see the title uh, Zoom group chat, handout 7, bracket, stage 3, task 3A hyphen 3C. Okay, so you can download that. Let me show you how this handout looks like. Hmm. Hold on for a while. Uh. Ah, yes, found it. Okay. So I hope you have downloaded the same thing that I'm showing. Okay? All right. Okay. Now, let me go through once again. Task 3A first, then 3B, and followed by 3C. Okay? All right. Now, could I just invite you to read through 3A? Mm. Okay. Over here, 3A. Read through it, and we'll talk about it.
All done? Just give you one more. Give it to it. Okay, let's talk about it, shall we? All right. Now, my friends, first things first. Let me draw your attention to the title of Task 3A, shall we? Come. Now, 3A, Egan calls it possible strategies. My friends, can you see the, can you see the similarity? 2A, Egan calls it possibilities. 3A, he calls it possible strategies. Right. So, to Egan, uh, he always believed in getting clients to think about broad things first. Uh. So, for 2A, it's about broad goals, broad possibilities. 3A is about getting clients to think about broad strategies, broad action strategies. Got it? So, Egan always believed in starting broad. Uh, and then narrowing it down. That's what you always believe in, basically. Okay. So, how? How can we go about getting clients to think broad or to generate broad possible strategies? Well, a familiar word awaits us again, isn't it? What's a familiar word? The word is brainstorming. Right. So, Egan, right, seems to be an ultra big fan of the word brainstorming. So once again, uh, he, will say, he will say what? Well, at 3A, we want to get our clients to brainstorm. Brainstorm as many possible strategies right, that the client may consider doing uh, so that it will help them to achieve their goals at stage 2. So same thing, that's what I told you on Monday. While we are doing 3A, we want to suspend our judgment as a counsellor. We also want to get our clients to suspend their judgment on themselves. So it's really about getting the client to brainstorm. Right? Without really paying much attention, whether are these strategies doable or not. So that's really about what you're trying to do at 3A, basically. So I provided for you some questions here that you can ask. Right? that will hopefully kickstart the brainstorming process. So you can ask your client. So let's say I have to ask Peter. So Peter, now that you know what you want, right? what do you need to do to get at least some of what you want? So notice? So by asking Peter this question, I hope Peter can now start to churn out, start to brainstorm, what might be some action strategies la, that he might want to consider doing in order to achieve at least some of what he wants. Now, if your client is someone that's into journey, you know journey? Right. I am. Right. What do you do? You can then ask this question. So, Peter, now that you know what are some of your possible destinations, what might be some different routes that you can take in getting there? So I use this a lot when I know that my client is someone that likes the metaphor of journey, who likes the metaphor of being on the road uh, or being on air or whatever not. Uh, so that's something which I use a lot. The third question that you can ask could be this one. Practical. What are some ways, Peter, that you can take to accomplish some of your goals. Straightforward, down to earth, pragmatic. You can ask that as well. Okay. So far okay? Quite easy to understand, right? Good. Now comes the best part. Now, all of us, we wish that by asking our client any one of these questions, clients will start to Tell us, right, some possible strategies, isn't it? That's our wish. Lah. But I'm sure you and I know, in reality, sometimes, after we ask our client any one of these questions, client may say, 
I don't know, uh, Lawrence. I don't know. I don't know what can I do. I'm clueless about how. How can I achieve my goals? I'm clueless. I don't know. Then what do you do? Uh? When your client tells you, I don't know what to do, what do you do? Well, before you offer your ideas, you can say, let's try to do something else. So what is the something else that we should do? Take a look. Something else we should do is here. We might want to ask our client some leading questions. First one, I could ask. So John or Peter, who might provide some possible strategies for you to consider? The who word comes on. So going back to my case study, Peter, this is what I ask him. I say, so Peter, who might provide some possible strategies for you to consider? And Peter said to me, well, Lawrence, I remembered three years ago, one of my ex-colleagues also lost his wife due to cancer. No joke, that's what he told me. I suppose I can always ask him how did he went about picking his life up again. So guess what? So as I asked Peter the whole question, he was able to remember that there was a guy in his network who experienced kind of a similar experience as him right now. And this person, this ex-colleague, could now become a resource for him to tap on. Can you follow me, my friends? So can you see? that as I ask the whole question, I may help Peter to think about a resource that can now help him to churn out some possible strategies. Now sometimes, right, the whole question may not work. Then what do we do? Then we can ask about which organization might provide some possible strategies for Peter to consider. So same thing for Peter, I ask. So Peter, which organization might provide you with some possible strategies to consider? And Peter looked at me and said, I have no clue. This is where I come in to say, well, as far as I know, Peter, right, there is one particular organization in Singapore that look into single parents' welfare. And this particular place is my company help FSC so I say well would you be keen to make an appointment to talk to one of the social workers or counselors there who might actually give you some leads lah, to how can you what can you do in achieving some of your goals that you told me so far so, guess what? As I ask the what organization, it opens up la, the possibility of him going to help Family Service Centre. And guess what? As Peter went to help Family Service Centre, my ex-colleagues over there actually recommended him a ready-made programme. So my friends, sometimes, right, out there in the counseling circle, there might be some ready-made programs that might be available for your client to consider as a possible strategy to achieve their goals. So what was the ready-made program that my ex-colleagues proposed to Peter to consider? Well, they proposed this particular idea called <coughs> PRISM. PRISM. Now, Help Family Service Centre, what they did was, when they first came into the scene, they actually went to Canada. And what they did was, they understudied this particular lady, if I'm not wrong, it's Susan something, I can't remember now. And Susan actually came up with a programme called Rainbows for All Children. And that was a support group concept which she wanted to make available for children who comes from single-parent families. 
And this particular program, right, she expanded it to also include teenagers and even single parents themselves. And what she did was, she actually gave color names la, to different age groups. So for young children, she calls it rainbows. For teenagers, she calls it spectrum. For young adults, she calls it kaleidoscope. And for single parents themselves, she calls it prism. prism. And when I was in help, we were actually running support groups for the whole entire uh, age group. La. So spending from rainbows all the way until single parents themselves. So I remember when Peter went to talk to my ex-colleagues at help, what did they do? They actually proposed to Peter to go and join a prism support group to help him to deal with his grief, to help him to learn to forgive himself so that he can be moving towards achieving his goals. Can you follow me, my friends? So guess what? So as I asked Peter all these three future probe questions, it gave Peter quite a lot of ideas about what are the possible strategies that he can consider doing. Notice, my friends, I said consider. Peter hasn't decided yet whether will he do these strategies or not. But at least we gave Peter what? Some possible strategies to consider. And that is all that we can ask for at this stage. Okay? Now, then you probably have a question for me, isn't it? Which is what? Hey, Robin, sir, what happens if, right, we ask Peter all these questions, right? The who, la, organization, la, ready-made program, la, right? Peter, not very keen, la. Peter asks you, Peter asks me, hey, Robin, sir, what do you think? La? What do you think I should do? Do you have any good recommendation la, about strategies that you will do la, if you are me? Are we allowed to offer these strategies? Well, good news. You can say we can offer. He even came up with a very cool name. La, this name. He called it the oh, prompt and fate technique. Oh, okay. Just in case you're wondering uh, whether I named this technique, I didn't. This name was gotten from Egan. Uh, the prompt and fate technique. So, why did Egan name this technique prompt and fate? Very simple. Now, the prompt part here refers to him prompting the client about possible strategies. The fate here is all about after he prompt the client about possible strategies, he wants to fade away and let the client decide whether these prompts are fitting or not fitting for the client. Got it? So that's why he called it the prompt and fit technique. So I actually included here for you how I may want to phrase it. Come, can you see here? So I may say to Peter, so Peter, here are some things that people with similar problems have tried. So this is where, right? Once you have gathered some experience in your work as a counsellor, rule of thumb to remember. Whenever you want to share ideas to your client, think first about what other clients of yours who experience similar issues as your client have tried to do that was helpful. Why? It's because as a client, if I hear that these are the strategies that other clients have tried that worked, I think I'll be more convinced to try it. Don't you think? That's why sharing ideas from other clients with similar problems as the client seems to be a better bet lah, when we want to share ideas to our clients. Of course, you're probably going to ask me, Robin, what happens if I'm new to the counseling field? Lah? Then how? Well, if you are new to the counseling field, right? If you happen to have older colleagues working with you, you can, even, you can even ask them, oh, hey, so, uh, Lawrence, uh, what, uh, your, your, your clients, right, who go through grief, uh, what do they do uh, that was helpful? And 
when you ask your older colleagues to tell you from their clients what was helpful, you can then share to your client. Oh, so Peter, this is what uh, my older colleague clients have tried. You know, uh, they tried A, B, C, and D, and Lauren said that it was quite helpful. What say you? So now you can be leveraging on your more experienced colleagues in your center to provide some pointers for you to then share with your clients. You follow? So that could be one way. Another way can be you can always go on the route of research as well. Okay, so you can say, well, Peter, you know, a research seems to suggest that these are the ideas that you can try. You know? So what say you about these strategies? So you can go on the research front as well. Okay? Yeah. Good. So far, am I making sense to you for 3A? Any questions for me about 3A? Thanks, Jeff, for searching for me, the, the name. Yes, Susan, yes. Susan Noyce, thanks. So, okay? Okay, huh? let me continue. So, let me go back now to 3B. Okay, at time. Yes. Sorry, Lawrence, did you call me? Uh, no, I didn't. Sorry. I was saying Jeff, actually. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Mm, thanks. Okay, good. So, where was I? Okay. So, now moving on, huh? Okay, now, by now you can guess, right? What can you guess? Now, 3B is kind of similar to 2B. What is similar? When we are doing 2B, what are we doing? We are trying to help our client to choose, isn't it? Same thing here. When we are doing 3B, we are also trying to get our clients to choose. But for 3B, we are getting our clients to choose what? To choose what are the best fit strategies from possible strategies. Got it? So I say again, for 3B, we are really trying to get clients to choose, to select what are the best fit strategies from the possible strategies. And once again, similar to 2B, what will help clients to make a, a more informed choice is when we bring in some criteria. And you can see once again here, these are some questions uh, that I may want to ask my client to help them to better select, to help my client to better choose uh, which are the strategies that will fit them more than other strategies. So once again, can you see some similarities here? So one criteria could be the realistic criteria. Right. So out of these five possible strategies, Peter, which are the ones that are considered the most realistic for you lah, in trying to achieve your goals? So the realism criteria becomes an important one again. Another one, out of all these strategies, Peter, which ones are best fitting to your resources? So that, as you apply them, you can be in, uh, achieving your goals better. So the best fit to your resources becomes important criteria again. Then of course, the values fit comes back again. Which strategies will best fit with your values? So that, as you do these strategies, you might be able to achieve your goals. Okay. So once again, these are some very helpful Questions that as we ask them, we hope that clients can begin to choose best fit strategies from all the possible strategies out there. Okay. So far, am I clear up to this point? Yes, very clear. Okay, uh, moving on quickly. Now we get to the final, final, final task of stage 3. I'm sure you're all very relieved to know that. Uh. Okay, so the final task of stage 3 is Plan. Yeah. Plan. My friends, this is where, right, Egan seems to be quite a CBT fan all of a sudden. 
<laughs> what do I mean? Now, later on, when you learn CBT from Kotner Koo, you will know that CBT people, we are, we are very, very on about planning. Why? It's because we believe in CBT that when clients plan, the likelihood of them implementing the plan will be higher. When clients have no plan, usually nothing will be carried out. So you'll find that after we got our clients to choose the best fit strategies, we now want them to think about a plan. A plan in terms of how can they implement the best fit strategies. So you want clients to come up with a detailed change plan. So how can we do that? I'm going to share with you my final handout of the module. It'll be handout number eight. So, Zana, could I trouble you to upload handout number eight for them? Thanks. Zana. Okay, it's available in the link okay. now. Thank you so much. Good. Thanks. Should be coming on soon. Yes, it's there already. You will see it on the Zoom group chat. Handout 8 says 3 task 3C. Let me show you um, how that looks like. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Let me finish off on an approach that I love, MI. Okay. So, this particular template, this particular handout, it's actually gotten from motivational interviewing. So could I trouble you to read through this handout? And then I'll walk you through how to use it. Okay? Yeah, I'll read through it. It's quite a helpful handout, lah, in my opinion. I use this quite a lot in my work. Well done. Let's talk about it. Okay, first things first. If your client happens to be someone who is literate, what can you do? In my opinion, you may want to allocate some time within the session to pass them this form to write. Give them about half an hour. If you have the time, you can spare the time. Huh? Let them really have the space to fill in this particular worksheet. After that, spend the remaining half an hour asking them questions about what they wrote on this worksheet. That is if your client is literate, basically. For those clients of yours who are illiterate, what can you do? You can still use this worksheet as a way of asking your client questions and you can use this worksheet to fill in their answers as they answer your questions. So both ways are actually quite helpful in my opinion. So come, let me walk you through how I will use it. So first, let me go straight to look at this particular item. This one. Now, for this particular table, what will be going into this column? Specific action. Well, what will be going into this column will be my client's best fit strategies. So I say again, uh, what will be going into this particular column of the table will be all of my clients' best fit strategies. And for every best fit strategies, I want to squeeze my client to think about the time frame. Example, if my client Peter say, well, Lawrence, I'm going to join the PRISM support group. I will ask, okay, when will you be joining the PRISM support group? Let's say. Let's say if my, uh, if my client Peter said, well, I want to be writing a letter to my late wife Mary to let her know how bad I feel towards her. When will you be writing this letter to Mary? 
Got it? So every best fit strategy, I want my client to come up with an estimated time frame. Why? It's because when clients come up with a time frame, the likelihood of them executing the strategy will be higher. Got it? That's what we do. Moving on quickly. Then we come to the next table. This table is where we want to get our clients to think about what? Who? You know, some clients, right? In order for them to execute the best fit strategies, they may need people around them to help them. Lah. So this is where lah, I want to get Peter to think about. So Peter, how can you go about implementing the strategies? Who need to be there to help you to kickstart this particular best fit strategy? Peter might say, well, Lawrence, maybe if I can get my ex-colleague, the guy who lost his wife three years ago, to go with me to the PRISM support group, maybe accountability is there. I will see through the support group. So guess what? So in this case, Peter's ex-colleague becomes an instrumental figure that Peter can rely on to kickstart this particular best fit strategy. Can you all follow me, my friends? So once again, the who becomes very important. Finally, we come to the last one. Now, in order to make this plan really realistic, we have to squeeze clients to what? To think about? Yeah. Potential obstacles. Because if we don't prepare our client for the potential obstacles, clients might be too idealistic in formulating this plan. So important, we always need to get clients to think about, okay, so what might be some potential obstacles that might derail you, that might prevent you, that might distract you, that might hinder you from rolling out all these strategies. Very important. And every obstacle the client say, we ask them, how are you going to respond if these obstacles were to show up? How are you going to deal with these obstacles if they were to show up? So this table, uh, my friends, is very important because this table will make the plan really down to earth. Without this table, I fear that your client's plan, my client's plan, will be too airy-fairy, will be too idealistic for the client's own good. Finally, we want to finish off this worksheet with a confidence scale. Why? Because we want the confidence scale to be a reality check. In other words, we want to make sure that all the strategies that's inside this worksheet, the time frame, the who can be helpful, all these are really doable. Once again, if a client gives you an ultra low number, like Matsyam 1 or 2, what do you do? You have to ask, why? Why do you give such a low number? What is it about this plan that you don't feel confident about? It could well be I have to bring the client back to the time frame, maybe. Right? The time frame. It could well be I may have to bring my client to even go back to 3B to reselect what is considered best fit. It could well be that my client have to rethink about the people. Will my ex-colleague be available? Maybe he might not be. Then how? The kind of idea. So it's really about going back, possibly to 3B, to even make sure that the best fit strategies are really best fit. So that the confidence number la, will be a lot healthier. So once again, the ding-donging back, Right, the going back to the earlier task will be something that I will do lah, if it helps to make this plan a lot more down to earth. Okay, yeah. All right, there we have it. All the three stages of Egan and all the nine tasks within Egan. Yeah. Okay, with two minutes to spare, not bad. <laughs> Questions for me about whatever that I shared. 
uh, night task, all the three stages. I'm sure you are concussed <laughs> with too much information. We need time to digest. Yes, I'm, I, I'm sure. Thanks, Jane. Yes, I'm sure. Yeah. But I hope, yeah, it, it sort of helps to make things a bit more clearer la, yeah, through these three weeks, the three lessons. Okay, not to hold you back further. Now, let me just quickly comment a little bit about the MCQ. So, I was told by uh, Zana that tomorrow, I think possibly evening time, you will be given the link to do your MCQ assessment. Now, there will be 20 MCQ questions that you need to do. Lah. Now, I was told that you are given two weeks to complete the 20 MCQ questions. And open book, lah, I'm sure you know, right? But you only have one attempt. Meaning, uh, each time when you see your screen, right, there will only be one question at a time. Lah. So, of course, with every question that's being flashed on the screen, you can refer lah, uh, your notes, lah, PowerPoint, whatever. Lah. So, but you only have one attempt to answer each of the 20 questions that will be flashed on your screen. Got it? And you have two weeks to complete all 20 questions. Okay? Now, if you ask me, I will say to you, it will be good for you to be reading through your PowerPoint slides. So you go back to your package, right? There are four set of PowerPoint slides which was emailed to you, which I hardly used. Uh, because I felt PowerPoint slides is too wordy, right? So it'll be a good uh, platform to go back to. And if I were to be you, also make sure that you have available in front of you all the eight handouts, uh, which I have been you know, uploading with Zana's help throughout our three lectures together. So I think with the PowerPoints and the eight handouts, you should have whatever that you need like, to do well for the 20 MCQ assignments. Okay, yeah. So any questions for me about the MCQ assignments? Can we have the questions, please? Of course cannot. La. <laughs> but good try, Elvin, good try, good try. <laughs> I, I, I try, guys, I try. But yes, yes. I was looking towards you to try actually. <laughs> so I'm not surprised that you tried. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Within two weeks, what's that? I mean, it's one try. Is there a time limit within that try? Ah, good question. I have to ask Sana for that. So Sana, any 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 ideas about that? Mm. It's yeah. the same time that you're given when you did your PCT. Oh, okay. I think it's four hours. Yeah. Oh, four hours. Ah. Okay, okay. I yeah. see. Oh, so PCT, there was also a 20-question 20, 20 assignment, is it? Yes, okay, they've done see, it before, yeah. Ah, then, then they should be very familiar with that already. Okay, mm, good. Thanks, Dana. Cool. Yeah, Chef, go for it. Mm. Uh, okay, you said that it's only one attempt. So basically, mm. it's a do or die, la. literally. You know, if yeah. we don't get it right, we don't get it right. Yes, That's you're right. right. Yes, you're right. Okay. Yes, you're right. Okay. Do or die. Okay. We got it. That's right. Mm, right. Thanks. Final thoughts, comments for me about whatever that I shared in the last three lectures. If not, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for persevering with me for the last three lectures. So I hope it has been helpful to you in some ways as I presented uh, the Egan Secret Harbor model to all of you. And I hope that even as you begin to do your practicum, I think it should be soon, right? I hope this particular ideas that I shared will be somehow helpful for you even as you begin to do practicum moving forward. Um, on the 23rd, don't forget, we still have round two uh, of our MI uh, model. So looking forward uh, to seeing you on the 23rd as I wrap up on MI with all of us. But till then, stay safe and healthy. I'll see you guys back on the 23rd of September. Thank you so much.